Welcome to the Clutch Kitten Gaming Podcast, where I play an indie game for five hours and let you know whether or not it's worth your time and money. Hello and welcome everyone, this is James, also known as Clutch Kitten, and I am stoked to be recording right now. You're listening to episode number 13, and that is crazy to me. When I started out the podcast, my focus was completely on just getting out three episodes, and that was truly a struggle. I had no experience recording, editing, or putting a podcast out on the interwebs, but honestly I've finally started feeling like I have some ground under my feet to stand on. We're 13 episodes in, and I love it because I'm able to put focus more on improving the podcast for all of you, and less just on putting out a chunk of episodes. I know I say it a lot, but truly, I wouldn't be doing the podcast if it wasn't for all of you continuing to listen, so I appreciate you taking time every week to do that. One announcement I want to make really quickly is that I've started putting the podcast on YouTube. What it looks like is that I put the audio from the podcast over the gameplay that I've recorded. For those of you who need more of that visual element and want to actually see the game I'm playing while you listen to the podcast, go ahead and head on over to my channel, which is the Clutch Kitten Gaming channel, and check out those videos. Currently, I have Battleship Brigade and Bunker Punks uploaded, and I'm hoping to get this episode on later this week. So what has been up in the gaming world? A headline that stood out to me this week was from a CNN tech article written by James Griffith that said, China just blocked Amazon's streaming service Twitch. That caught me off guard when I read it. Can a country block Twitch? Or Amazon for that matter? If you've been living under a rock and you're unfamiliar with Twitch, it's the world's top gaming streaming service. So if you ever want to watch a live stream of someone playing Blackout, Spider-Man, or even the game I'm reviewing today, the first stop you would probably make would be Twitch. So it was super surprising hearing that China blocked this service in their entire country. According to the article, one large reason that this took place was due to a ton of people being upset that the state-run TV didn't air the esports events at the Asian Games. Since the state-run TV didn't air those competitions, people flooded to Twitch since they were being streamed on that service. Apparently this isn't the first time China's pushed back against large foreign companies like Amazon. According to the article, China is notoriously sensitive about foreign companies providing media content in its territory. Unless, of course, they agree to the type of stringent censorship local firms do. In 2016, Chinese services from Disney and Apple were shut down as the government tightened regulations governing online content. I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see how this plays out. What I mainly wonder is what it looks like for the Chinese streamers who were relying on Twitch as their source of income. I I really have no idea if there's a way to bypass those restrictions, but I can imagine it's causing some worry in the Chinese streaming scene. It kind of seems like we're running a theme of government control in the podcast right now. Last episode, we talked about the evil corporations and bunker punks. In our news today, we have China booting Twitch out of their country. And now, this week's game is based in a cyberpunk universe where a large corporation, again, is seeking to make decisions for the entire population. Let's jump right in. Today's game is called The Red Strings Club. It's a single player, 2D, cyberpunk narrative adventure game and was released on January 22nd, 2018. It was developed by Deconstruct Team, which is a Spanish video game developer based in Valencia. They were founded on March 13th of 2012 by Jordi Di Paco. And other than the Red Strings Club, they're best known for developing Gods Will Be Watching in 2014. I don't believe I've played any of the other games they've made, but after playing the Red Strings Club, I'm super interested in checking out some of their other games. The Red Strings Club costs $14.99 on Steam, and according to HowLongToBeat.com, it takes 4 hours to beat the main story and and 5.5 hours if you're a completionist. For controls, the game doesn't support gamepad as far as I'm aware. I played with keyboard and mouse, and for the most part it controlled well. One of the minigames felt a little bit odd, but I think that was more because of the nature of the game and less because of the controls themselves. Let's shift our focus now to the story. Enter with me now. A future where implants are the norm. Not only implants that make you stronger, smarter, and faster, 
but ones which give you a boost in confidence, more charisma, and even help you not give a f about the negative comments you get on a social media post. Lately, there have been some odd movements in the city. The corporation that controls implants, Supercontinent, has had a change in leadership, and the rebel faction that continues to fight implants has started to spread rumors about a dangerous new advancement in human-enhancing technology. What's interesting is that in this world of tomorrow, the individual that holds the most influence isn't a politician, a weapons dealer, or a modded-out thug. He's an information brokering bartender who uses his cocktail crafting skills to extract secret and sometimes dangerous facts from his patrons. I think the best place to start in describing the story of this game is by telling you about the primary characters. The first is Donovan the bartender. The game gives you the impression that he runs the Red Strings Club. Whether or not that means he owns it, he's the face of the club since most people who walk in the door know him, or at least know of him. He's an information broker, meaning that he obtains information from patrons, generally without them realizing, which he can then use as leverage in whatever situations he finds himself in. Although it might sound seedy, he really is a gentleman in a fine establishment. The reason that he took to information brokering was due to its usefulness in a dark world and his uncanny knack for manipulating emotions through cocktails. The second main character is Brandis. The game actually starts out with him falling from a skyscraper and the entire game explains how you get to that moment. He's the modded out partner of Donovan and unlike his counterpart, he uses less subtle means to get the information he needs, whether it be through impersonation, espionage, or hacking. The game gives you the idea very quickly that these partners take life one step at a time. They're freelancers. They do what works best for them. There are points where they've helped the rebel cause and others where they've been on the side of the corporation. You learn more about their leanings as the game progresses, but they start out in a very morally neutral place. The third main character is Akara, an AI android that appears at the club's doorstep early on in the game and becomes a very helpful sidekick. She was created with the ability to evaluate ethical dilemmas in addition to having a wide variety of other useful strengths. The Red Strings Club is set in a large metropolis but most of the game is played in just a few locations with the club being the primary one. Without getting into spoilers, let's dive a little more deeply into how the game plays out. The main drive of this game is the narrative. Although there are some pretty clever mini-games strewn throughout your experience, a lot of the time you're going to be having conversations with other characters. It actually made me feel like I was in a cyberpunk noir TV show. You play through a scene, and the game cuts to a new scene which builds upon the information you already know. The flow of the game is very linear in terms of which scenes take place at what point, but what makes it especially interesting is that a majority of the dialogue you have in each conversation is not linear. During a dialogue, you often get response options that you can choose between in order to play out the story exactly how you want it. Maybe a character enters and you have a preconceived notion that they're bad. The dialogue options will most likely give you the ability to be rude or short with that character, which will result in a different turn of events than if you were nice to them. I absolutely love games with dialogue options like this. In games like Fallout 4 and Deus Ex Human Revolutions, I always enjoyed being able to manipulate someone in a conversation to get a better outcome for myself. Or in Skyrim, for example, sometimes I just felt like being a complete asshole to the Thane, and that was completely okay. What's different about the Red Strings Club is that your dialogue choices feel much more impactful. In many of the situations, you have a direct influence on how much or what type of information you get out of a person, which will obviously affect how you tackle issues later on. One very thematic and cool tool that game adds is your map of events. If you click a button in the top left of your screen, it brings you to a very minimal looking diagram. It has a bunch of dots along the timeline that scroll to the right. What you realize is that each dot represents a different story beat that you come to based upon your dialogue choices. There are some scenes which you realize have two to four different narrative outcomes, and some only have one. What I love about the addition of the map is that in doing so, the developers show you as the player the impact of your decisions. It also shows you all the different variations you missed due to the other decisions you made. As a result, it got me very interested in revisiting the story to find out what other ways I can go about the narrative. 
Let's shift gears to a few final narrative points. First, you receive story elements primarily through dialogue. There's a lot of reading. Other than the dialogue, there aren't a lot of other story building elements. There are a few objects in the world that you can interact with, and you carry a notebook with some objectives and notes on characters, but the purpose of the notebook, for example, is to help you as the player keep your thoughts straight, and not so much to provide new information. Second, let's look at the quality of the writing. Since the narrative is so central to the game, is the writing actually good? I was incredibly impressed by the writing in this game. My wife and I played this together, and we were both sucked in by the narrative. The characters felt real. Even though we were looking at 2D pixelated characters without voices, the dialogue brought them to life and gave them meaning and emotion. The last point I want to touch on was the nature of the writing. This game tackles some heavy topics like sexuality and poses a lot of existential and ethical questions. Is it okay to control someone if it keeps them from doing something bad? Do you need consent to control someone if it's for their own good? What would it be like if there was no pain or depression in the world? There are some deep topics that are tackled, and I appreciate how the developers steer the story. They don't answer the questions straight up, but they do push you as the player to think more fully about those concepts. As we mentioned just a moment ago, the Red Strings Club is narrative focused, but that doesn't mean the mechanics are bad at all. In order to break up what could turn into a tedious reading session, the developers incorporated a few different mini-games into the story. First and probably most enjoyable to me was making cocktails. Right when I realized this game had a cocktail creation element, I actually went and made my wife and I some super tasty ginger pear bourbon cocktails. It was actually a lot like an old fashioned if you substituted ginger pear for the orange and cherry that you usually find in that drink. Anyways, cocktail creation makes complete sense for the game since one of your main characters is a bartender. So how does it work? Let's pretend you're Donovan for a moment you're cleaning up the bar, and Joe Schmo walks in. You realize as you make eye contact with Joe that he has some information you really want to get your hands on. So, when he asks for a drink, you move into the minigame and you're presented with a few different emotions of Joe. Let's say that they're anger, self-doubt, and happiness. You then have the ability to create a drink which causes him to feel one of those emotions, and you do so by pouring different combinations of liquor into his glass. The actual mechanics of pouring liquor into the glass or the cocktail shaker is really easy, but it's actually a ton of fun as well. You can dick around as much as you want with the bottles of liquor, but when you create the drink you want, the system makes you feel like you're an experienced bartender. What is also so clever about this minigame is that it directly plays into the narrative. For example, let's say you want to find out information about Joe's boss, who you know he's not fond of. If you give Joe a drink that causes him to be angry, he's much more likely to spill info about his boss that he might not tell you if he was in a forgiving or relaxed mood. Similarly, if Joe created a top secret device that you wanted to know about, you could give him a drink that caused him to feel prideful, and you could play off of that pride. The way the game merges dialogue options with bartending is so seamless. You end up feeling like a cocktail connoisseur who is also an expert at extracting the information you need through manipulation. Let's look briefly at one other mini game which you play, a little bit less than bartending, but which is still very fun. This game is pottery. It's such a random and abstract game for a cyberpunk world, but the way it's done is absolutely awesome. Since I don't want to spoil the story beat around why you're even doing this mini game, I'll just tell you about how it works. At one point in the game, you're in a location with a pottery wheel, and in order to move forward with the story, you have to shape certain objects to match a template. You start out with a block square of some sort of material, you place it on your pottery wheel, then you start clicking with your mouse to start spinning the wheel, and then you get to use three different chisels with your mouse to kind of chisel down that block square into whatever the template is. It really isn't that difficult, but what's so great about this game is first, that it had some amazing music that played while you craft the object, and second, it's such a good palette cleanser for all of the narrative. It's a chill and easy game that allows you to digest the dialogue that you had just been having. In addition to those two mini-games, there's also some dialogue-based puzzles. The first of which are tests that a card gives you after some conversations you have. When a patron comes in to get a drink and starts talking with you, 
Akara is off to the side evaluating them with her AI abilities and figuring out what their motives are. After the patron leaves, Akara then gives you a little quiz about the person's motives and what they're thinking about. The quizzes not only get you to think about interesting topics, but they also test how well you paid attention to the details of the dialogue. I think this was a way for the developers to make sure that you were keeping up with the story and what was going on. It was actually pretty difficult for us because we had to stop playing before the first quiz and picked up the next day, which put us at a disadvantage when it came to remembering what happened in that conversation. What's nice is that if you absolutely can't pass the quiz, which is to get at least 7 out of 10 of the questions, you can just move on with the story. You get a small prize if you get enough of the questions right, but it's not going to change the game drastically if you can't pass the quiz. The other dialogue-based puzzle is where you play Brandis and imitate different characters' voices on the phone in order to get the information you need. For example, if there's a password you need from one person, you could call them using the voice of their love interest to try and coax out that information. If you called as Brandis, they'd be like, what the hell are you doing calling me? Who are you? But if you call using a voice of someone they know, someone they trust, you might be able to get that information out. So there's an entire dialogue-based puzzle kind of around that mechanic. Let's step back really quickly and look at the gameplay loop. The loop of this game is incredibly satisfying. You're presented with a strong narrative, which is broken up by palate-cleansing games and narrative-driven puzzles. If you were to take the cocktail-making or pottery minigames out as just standalone titles, they really wouldn't hold up, but they serve a specific purpose in the Red Strings Club, and they accomplish that purpose excellently. I know I've already given this game a lot of praise, but I'm actually about to give it some more now that we're talking about the art style and music. This is a 2D pixel art game that I think gives Celeste a run for its money. The Red Strings Club is much less colorful and vibrant than Celeste, but it uses pixel art in such a creative way. The world has the feel of Blade Runner, it's dark with neon accents, and there's a lot of rain and lightning. Basically what you'd expect from a cyberpunk game. When you're taken to the Red Strings Club, it gives you more of those noir vibes. In some ways it takes you back in time, with the piano in the corner, the warm colors, and easy listening blues in the background. One small detail I loved was when a character lit a cigarette while they were at the bar. You would see the red tip while they inhaled, and a small puff of smoke would come up. Needless to say, the art was wonderful, and I think the music held its own as well. In conjunction with the art, the music shifted style when you were in or out of the club. In the club, there was normally some easy listening blues or jazz. Outside of the club, the music was much more electronic and futuristic. In my opinion, the music didn't steal the show, but it had an outstanding performance nevertheless. Now that we've looked at the narrative, the gameplay, and the art, let's summarize some of the standout positives and negatives. On the positive side, the way the developers wove every aspect of this game into a strong narrative was impressive. The flow and pacing was just right, and almost everything I did made me feel clever or talented. There were most definitely choices that were better than others, but the game didn't punish you for making one decision over another. It just gave you an alternative route in the story. On the negative side, I personally would have enjoyed a bit more complexity in the pottery and cocktail creation minigames. It's really a minor complaint because I just praised how well the games were integrated into the story, I just think there could have been a little bit more done. At its most complex, the cocktail game gave you six liquors to use, ice, and a cocktail shaker, which all affected the drink. In my mind, they could have added one or two more elements to bring that game from an A to an A+. We've made it to the final boss. This is the part of the podcast where I tell you whether you should slay the game and buy it, flee the game and avoid it, or farm up and wait for a sale. If you haven't guessed it already, my verdict is to slay the game. This was such a unique and enjoyable experience. In my mind, it hits similar notes to what Donut County did. It's a bite-sized game that doesn't require core gaming skills to play it. It's definitely a much darker, more philosophical, and more mature game than Donut County, but if you're looking for a solid gaming experience and you enjoy the aesthetic, this game is definitely for you.
As always, thank you all for listening. Now that we're 13 episodes in, I would love to hear some feedback on games that you've decided to play because of the podcast. Did you enjoy them? Do you agree with my verdict on the game? I would really enjoy hearing about your experience. So if you want to share, or you just have a random question for me, go ahead and shoot me an email at clutchkittengaming at gmail.com. If you want to learn more about me and what's going on with the podcast, you can also follow at clutchkittengaming on Instagram and Facebook, and KKG Podcast on Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, and if you guys enjoy what you hear, go ahead and give it a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher. I hope that you guys have a stellar rest of your day, and I'll see you in-game.